Let's see. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am looking forward to our, our time together. We will, we will jump straight in because uh, there's a lot I'd like to think about. And really, I'm keen to hear the questions you will have and to listen to the dialogue that we share with each other. Um, No, I was not. I was tracking. <laughs> All right, it's going to be a quick argument. So you've got 30 seconds more to come up with your reasons not and your reasons for. Right here we go. Let's um, let's hear from the floor then. Uh, let's hear from this side. Why should why should they pay taxes to Caesar? First argument. To make civil society keep going, however wretched the Roman oppressors and occupiers may be, they give us decent roads. We need society to work. Argument against. They are a wretched empire. They're not us. They're not welcome, all right? And uh, can you turn what, is what sounds like a political argument? Could you come up with an ethical-sounding framing for that? Um, well, it would be a murderous wretched empire. There we are, yeah. Now we've, now we've got ethical, an ethical violation. Now, argument four, we should pay taxes. Like it's important to contribute to 
It's important to contribute to our community by paying taxes. We are simply uh, paying an, uh, an administrator. We are not complicit in his policies. Argument against, we should not pay taxes to Caesar. Still a wretched empire. <laughs> okay. um, it's, it's tricky, really. Now, we know the answer. Um, here, here's the answer. Oh, bother, I meant to show you that so you could be entertained while you were talking. Okay. Um, we know the answer. It, yeah, it's this one. But Jesus realized their evil intentions and said, Hypocrites, why are you testing me? Show me the coin used for the tax. So they brought him a denarius. Jesus said then, Whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. He said to them, Then give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Well, it's a bit of a brilliant answer, actually. In fact, it's so brilliant it gets recorded in three Gospels and passed on for two millennia, and we still read it and think, wow, that was a brilliant answer. Here is Jesus, uh, in a sense, showing but really teaching us how to know what is right, and then how to do it Well, you just pay the denarius. Um, but let's, let's take this apart. Um, is Jesus answering their question? Uh, not as worded, no. No, what's, what's he doing? He's challenged, he's questioning the question, which is what any good student and certainly what any good teacher should do. He's questioning the question. He's undermining it. He's subverting it. Uh, first of all, he questions their motive. If we're going to talk ethics, let's start with your intention toward me. That's the real problem. Um, the previous picture imagined something I had never thought of before. What if there were a beggar right there and he sees a denarius floating around with no one wanting to claim it? Well, he's got good use for it. Um, second, Jesus goes deeper than uh, the practice to the principle. What's the principle that he states here? There's something that belongs, yes? Uh, actually, I'm making a suggestion in the form of a question. Please. Um, one of the translations I've read for this verse is, uh, uh, render unto Caesar Caesar's way. Render unto God God's way. And that this is a call for civil disobedience. Huh. May I look at that after? Because I, I would need to check the I would need to check the Greek on that one. Um, I think it's Caesar's things. I think it's a plural, so it would. But but let me check that later. That that is intriguing. Okay, that'd be great. Um, well, he's going to the principle, and the principle is this: that there are things that belong to Caesar, so we give them to Caesar. He goes beneath the practice to the principle. For Jesus, there are layers in his ethical thinking. Practice, but beneath practice is principle. But there's something that goes deeper than principle. And, and I think this is a turn that Christian ethics has taken really more in the last 20 or 30 years. Deeper than principle is role. Role. In what role should these people who are questioning Jesus pay tax to Caesar? In in the role of, well, not properly citizen. I, want, I wanted to say citizen too, but I questioned it once you said it. <laughs> um, that's not <laughs> fair, sorry. Um, as, uh, as people who live within that land, who are inhabitant, exactly. Um, so as inhabitant, the principle applies, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and then the practice is, well, this coin has Caesar's image on it, and so we give it to him. But that's not where Jesus ended up, is it? And to God, the things that are God's. Well, let's apply this framework then, also these ethical layers to Jesus' statement, and to God. What practice relates to this one? And what is the principle? And in what role 
should they give things to God that belong to God? Any thoughts? He, exactly. He chooses a term that should resonate for them. Image. Whose image is this? Whose writing is on it? That then begins to hint at the role. Whose image, on whom is God's image? On whom is God's writing? Or about whom does God write? And then what practice does that lead to? And so Jesus, in framing his answer the way he does, not only subverts the question, questions and their motives, but goes to something far deeper and more inclusive. He's going back to Genesis chapter 1. Then God said, let us make the human person in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion. So God created the human person in his image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. Since humans are made in God's image, that is our role. Now let's go back and apply the layers. If that's our role, what's the principle? We give to God the things that are God's. Well, that starts with us. We give to God our whole selves. Caesar may have this denarius, but God gets me. But it goes beyond that. Because in Genesis 1, when God makes us in his image, God entrusts to us all of creation. What are we then to give to God? All of creation. And so suddenly this question, which was simply meant to, meant to stir up political division and to make Jesus look bad to one group or another, he, Jesus has completely outflanked, stri stripped his questioners of their um, public honor, and framed it in a, much and in, in a reference to the entire human vocation, that we and this world belong to God, and we as God's vice regents are to give it to him. Here, the practice follows from the role. In chapter 2, looking from a different angle, the narrator says that Yahweh God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to serve it and to keep it. The man is there in the garden to do what God was doing. God had been planting the garden. The man was watching. Now God puts the man in the garden and says, you do that too. The, the practice follows from the role. God made us in his image to be like him and to do like him for him in his world. We've been hearing from Matthew. Now I think John would like a turn to talk. And John says, ah, yes, I, in fact, that's how I start my gospel, resonating with the opening words of Genesis. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. John is using a way of talking about God's interaction with God's world that um, was well known from the Jewish philosopher from Alexandria, Philo, who was a contemporary of John and Paul and Peter and Jesus. Philo wanted a way to talk about the transcendence and magnificence of God and to still talk about God's creation of and providence in the world without bringing God too close. So Philo talked about this logos, this word or reason. Philo took the, Plato's idea of forms and said those are actually the thoughts and the speech of God. And so word was a way that Philo could show God, the creator, interacting with his world without being tainted by his world and all of this substance and earthiness. So John picks that up, and that's what we're resonating with. And then John says the unthinkable. 
and the word became flesh. Well, at this point, Philo is in spasms because the whole point of talking about the word was to keep God disconnected from it. The, world is, the word is the intermediary. Now the word does the very thing the word was conceived not to do, becomes flesh himself and lived among us and we have seen his glory. The glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. <coughs> grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. The Son, John says, shows us the Father. Now let's go back to the layer, ethical layer of role. What is the Son's role? Who is he? The practice is he's making the Father known. What's the role? Yes. I, I think it is to give us an understanding of how this works. Sure. Sure. Yes. As opposed to Yahweh being known. Uh huh. Okay. Um, to a way of knowing God, that's his intention. But what is the identity within which Jesus does that? It is through being God himself the image of the invisible God. And so now God himself comes to earth, takes on flesh, so that we can see God. This is the role. And so when they looked at Jesus, they saw glory. They saw the Father's glory reflected in the Son, full of grace and truth. But John also makes another comment here, and it's a little bit curious, and I'd like to explore it with you. Uh, John says, the law indeed was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So is it law or is it grace? Now with the coming of God in the person of Jesus Christ, is the, is the law done? Is it bad? Now we've got grace and truth, a completely different way of living. Is this what John is trying to say? That is often how John is interpreted here, but I would argue that there's something quite different going on. Think about the giving of the law to Moses, and then look at that word pair, grace and truth. You may remember that shortly after Yahweh gave the law to Moses, Moses said, I want to see you. And John is saying right here, no one's ever seen God. But God said, Moses, come up to this cave and I will pass by and you will see the glow behind me as I pass. And Yahweh came down and proclaimed his name to Moses. Yahweh, Yahweh, the God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Now this is the standard way of translating this Hebrew pair, chesed and emet. I would argue that what John is doing in his opening of, to his gospel is translating these, this Hebrew pair and saying grace and truth. So the contrast is not between two different ways of living, law and grace, two different ethical standards, law and grace. The, sta the contrast is between the law and the lawgiver. The law came through Moses. The lawgiver came in Jesus. Here we encountered God's words. Here we encounter God. And so what is so transcendently superior about this now is that it's God himself that we are meeting. And here in encountering the fullness of grace and truth, the fullness of God's own character, we receive grace upon grace. Matthew's turn now. Matthew would say, well, you know, I, I, I argue something similar early in the Sermon on the Mount as I record Jesus' teaching there. Jesus says, do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same 
will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's a, a shocking, a bold, and frankly, a despair-inducing statement. Because we know the way the Gospels present the Pharisees, that these are people who are fastidious about keeping the law of God. Jesus rebukes them later on about how they go to their herb garden, count the fullness of the harvest, find a tenth of these little tiny leaves, and give it to God. And Jesus said, yeah, you shouldn't stop doing that. So how can we improve on that? How can our righteousness go beyond that? That's why I framed the question the way I did at the beginning. How does Jesus show and teach us to know and do what is good and right? Jesus is pushing us here beyond righteousness, construed in a very narrow technical sense, to goodness. And he's going to do that. I'm going to highlight three different ways he does that in the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it was said of in, to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. Jesus is affirming the law, not getting rid of it. He's not saying suddenly, oh, murder's okay now. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. Jesus is not saying the law doesn't count. Jesus is not saying the law suddenly is no longer an ethical norm that, uh, that teaches us. In fact, Jesus continues to insist on a very real judgment. But he is going to something deeper than the practice. He's going to attitude, to the principle. Anger and insult matter Two. Then Jesus turns to adultery. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Adultery is still not okay. But lust, lust, the attitude that leads to adultery, that too is wrong. Jesus is addressing the attitude and not just the action. He is going deeper than righteousness narrowly construed and is pushing at goodness. Now, both of these are negative commands. Jesus is about to move into a positive command, and that's really where the frontier of goodness stretches out. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So what's the practice? What practice is Jesus highlighting here in these verses? What should they do? Help others. On the, uh, on the third line, what else should they do? Love, Love your enemies. One more practice. Pray for your enemies. What's the principle beneath that? Love your enemies. But Eye for eye? I, um, I think in many ways it would. I, I think that's why these words don't make sense. I, the, the clearest example we get of that is if we read Psalm 139, where David, the psalmist, is wrestling with his thoughts. He's got deep, deep hate for his enemies. And yet, in that intimate view into the psalmist's heart, the psalmist himself is asking, is this right? 
but we have to. Yes. Yep. We're, uh, so, I mean, if we want to split out um, practice between uh, action and speech, now we're getting down into thoughts, um, uh, and then beneath that, attitude. And but the fact that thoughts are defined often by words. Yes. Yep. Yep. So then the question is this, in what role are we to love our enemies? What is the identity that we are acting out when we do that? Early. acting as children of God. Look, God makes the rain fall on everyone, including the people who hate him. So you love the people who hate you. Your father does it, you do it. The role is children of God. It goes much deeper, it goes much deeper from than just practice to principle, but right down to role. So action, attitude, identity. Don't murder, the attitude is don't even, ang don't even be angry or insult. The action is no adultery. The attitude is no lust. But underpinning all of this is this identity that we are the Father's loved children. So we act like Him. And as Mary Lou just reminded us, with this goes back to not just being the children of God now, but this goes back to our beginning in God making us to be His image bearers. Jesus is not content to leave us there as though this were e easy and we just needed one more challenge. He pushes us further, and this is one that really um, admonishes me. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet... Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? As we m think back to your childhood, and this is a dangerous question because perhaps for some of you this was true, but did you worry about your next meal? There are children who do, but did you? Did you worry about your next meal? When did you, how old were you before you started to think, where's my next meal coming from? <laughs> exactly, it's really rather humorous. <laughs> <laughs> so, as we mature, um, we begin to develop a sense of responsibility, and then, as we are wont, responsibility errs over into worry. And we have this sense that if I worry, I'm somehow being more responsible than if I just did it. Um, but as children, we never wondered, and we did not worry. Here again, why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, ev even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? When did you start to worry about not which clothes you would wear and whether they match and look nice, but whether you would have clothes? I don't think I've worried about that yet. So don't worry, saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear, for it's the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. The practice is don't worry. What's the principle that underpins that? Trust, a deep, deep trust. And in what role do we exercise that trust? We are children of God. And in the same way that you trusted your parents implicitly when you th were three, four, and five years old, not 14, <laughs> it's falling apart by that point, um, so we too implicitly trust God. We don't even start to worry when we fully inhabit that role. And in the same way, and this is what has rebuked me, in the same way that I am irritated with my children when they question whether they will eat or will have clothes, 
I wonder how, what my father thinks when I worry. I wonder if he can handle something and if it will really work out. Thankfully, he's more patient than I am. And I love the way what, what Jesus says here, so don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow can worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Curiously, so let's go back to the question, how does Jesus show us how to know and do what's right? This is the essence of Jesus' own identity. When Jesus himself was baptized, there was a voice from heaven that said, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And straight from that river and that moment of public declaration of Jesus' loved identity, he goes into the wilderness to face the devil. And the devil's question is, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, the devil is attacking his identity, but the identity has been affirmed already. For Jesus too, this is the role that he inhabited. And this is what he taught us to pray. When you pray, don't go on and on and on thinking you'll get God's attention, but address your father as your father, our father in heaven. because your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Back to John. In John's introduction, we skipped over this verse, but John says, to all who received Him, who believed in His name, He gave power to become children of God. This is the grace upon grace that we have received from Jesus, who was full of grace and truth. And so it is not that we imagine ourselves to be God's loved children or that we take up the, 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 uh, the character in a play of being God's children, but that we are actually born of God. We are actually God's children. We have received from Him His nature the way that our children receive from us our nature or that we received our nature from our parents. And so Jesus, on the night before he was betrayed, speaks to his followers and says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. And as I have loved you, so you must love each other. It's, from, it's a family. The Father loving the Son, the Son loving his followers, and now we love each other. Loved children love. If you wander out to a playground one of these fall days and you see a bunch of children playing, is it difficult to tell the children who are loved from the children who aren't? Often it's quite obvious. There is a security and an openness and a freedom in children who are loved by their parents. For others, it's not there as much. We are loved and so we love. Later on, John will write in his letter, God is love. We know this because he sent his son into the world as the sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. Our role is God's loved children. That then gives us a whole set of principles that correspond to that role, and those principles lead us in an almost natural sense, natural way, into the actions that follow from those. Now, I can't ignore Paul as a Pauline scholar. So, Paul, I'm going to give him a few words as well. Uh, this is what Paul is saying. Uh, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Oh my goodness, did everybody note all of those? <laughs> practice, 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 practice. We can try to memorize all the practices or we can go for the role. And there's only one role. Here it is. As God in Christ has forgiven you, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Beloved children put away bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander. Beloved children put away malice. Beloved children are kind to each other and tender-hearted. When we act, when we are true in this role, when we are faithful to it, when we act with integrity in this role, these are the principles and the practices that will follow. 
because this is who we are. Once more from Paul, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bear with one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. And above all, clothe yourselves with love. Again, practice, 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 or a single role. People who are loved, and we live in that role. This is a tall order. It is frankly impossible. We, Jesus shows us how to live this way, but then when we contemplate it ourselves and wonder, how will I do this? It's, it's really intimidating. One last word from Paul. Because you are children, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. We become God's children. This is actually who we are, because the Spirit of the Son living in our hearts fills us with God's love. And so Paul says, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Live as loved children with the, with the Father's Son's Spirit in you, and then you will not be subject to the law. Why? Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. The Spirit now leads us in the path that the law always prescribed, the path of love and joy and peace. But the law could never enable us to do it. The Spirit, on the other hand, gives us life, to the power to live out this role. So how does Jesus show and teach us how to know and do what is good and right? Jesus, the Word, is God and comes and takes on flesh to show us God's own character, grace and truth. We see in Him the loved Son. What does He teach us? He teaches us also this role and how this role, living as loved children, fulfills the law's ethical requirements. It's a new and a new way of living. How do we know what is right? The principles and practices for doing what is good and right flow from this role, from this identity. How do we do it? We do it because we don't just know it. The law always taught, but the law did not empower. Ethical principles do not empower. They simply distinguish right from wrong. But the Spirit of God makes us God's children and gives us life and power actually to live this role. This is how we do it. And we move beyond right, narrowly construed, though the Hebrew Scriptures would not construe it narrowly. We move beyond right to goodness, pushing out not just from not doing bad, but to doing the positive good of love. This is how Jesus shows and teaches us how to know and do what is good and right. All right, your questions. I doubt I've answered everything. I hope I've stirred up some good questions. So I'd love to hear what you are thinking. Yes, Gregory. Yes. Um, what can we read into the fact that he has to bring them to this point? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I skipped over that point, but I think that is what he's doing. He is really sly, and he's, he's not just questioning motives. He's, he's questioning the whole person. Look, you're already complicit because you're carrying that thing around. Yeah, I think so. Yes, please. Make a comment. Yeah. Uh, I think you've laid out the concept of what Jesus is bending over here, eloquently here. Um, but you also said that it's very difficult for someone to offer this kind of thing. Yes. And so here's all of my thinking stuff. <laughs> what, what the humanity that we have is just, which is so much. Yeah. 
No. Okay. Oh, well, right. Yeah. May I? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. M may I try to answer? Yeah. There's a whole chapter in my thesis on this. So. <laughs> no. 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 I, and and that's fine. Um, so the question for those who are online is. Uh, these are wonderful principles. I have displayed them marvelously, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, they're intimidating, if not impossible. Th what, ab what about our humanity, our weakness? How, how do we respond to this? Um, first of all, it's good. God made us from earth because he wanted to. And when God looks at the humans that he has made, he says, this is very good. And yet, in our earthiness, in being essentially pots, um, we're weak. Jesus confronts this on the night in <laughs> on the night of his greatest struggle, when his closest friends cannot stay up with him and pray. That's what he needs, but they can't. And Jesus acknowledges the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We are weak because of how we are made. Paul takes this image a little bit further, and he says, we're all clay pots. Now, that's something that goes back to Isaiah the prophet, if not others before him. We are all clay pots, but the, in these clay pots are eternal, is eternal power. Because the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead inhabits these clay pots. And so we walk around still with these bodies that are made for this old world, these bodies that are decaying, and yet within those bodies is new creation power, the power that raised Jesus from the dead. And so is this impossible? Yes, but the Spirit makes us alive. The Spirit gives power to our mortal bodies so that we actually are enabled to live the way that we want. We are enabled to live the way God has made us to live. The, the struggle Paul puts so poignantly in Romans 7 is, I want to do, I love God and want to keep his law, but I can't. And when I try, sin is always there and my, I'm, I'm weak. He ends chapter 7 with, who will rescue me from this body of death? And a few verses later, he says, it's the Spirit of God who gives life to this body of death. So I'm still living in a body that's going to die. But the power I have inside is actually able to transform me. That, that honestly, is one of the most liberating, hope-giving, transforming truths I've ever contemplated. I've, I've been trying to work this out in my life for 25 years now. And, and the, the deeper the Spirit leads me into it, the more I discover my own freedom, my own true humanity, and my joy in following Jesus. Um, I think others will bring this up, and I'm sure Tiffany will talk more about it when we get to virtue ethics. But it's impossible, but we're empowered, is, is a very short answer. Thank you for your question. Tiffany. I was just going to, I was just going to follow that with a practical question. Sure. Ah, easy question. All right. <laughs> um, 
the, the two questions, how it in, in difficult situations, how do I discern what's good and right, and then how do I plug into this power to actually do what's good or right? Um, it, this answer is long and involved. I'll, I'll mention a few things. Um, first, Paul describes the, the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5 as tugging at us from within um, and that we respond to his desires. That, like any kind of tugging, we get better at feeling it the longer we try to feel it. We, we mature into it. Um, a, a practice I used to do with some of my students, sometimes when we would have a mentoring session, I would say, let's just go for a walk. And uh, we would walk together around the campus. Um, and I would never say, I'm leading or you're leading. And when we would come to an intersection in a sidewalk, I would never say, let's turn this way or that way. I would just sort of do it. And I would, I would watch. And about half an hour into the conversation, I would say, do you know what's been happening for the last half hour? You've been following me. And I haven't had to tell you what to do because instinctively you saw where I was going and you were keeping in step. And it, it's actually, it's a very natural practice. We, we learn it with our parents when we're tiny. And yet this is what the Spirit of God is doing for us now. As we mature into it, to discern the invisible, to feel the unfeelable, <laughs> um, we learn to keep step with him. So that's the first principle. The second principle is the law continues to teach us. The Spirit does not say, oh, the law was old and rubbish and you just ignore the whole thing. The Spirit leads us in the path that the law had always pointed out for us. And then, of course, good counsel <laughs> is always good. The power. Um, I, I think the way to hook into the power is help. <laughs> and I think that's when the help comes. Um, yes. Sure. So, no, that's, that, that's fine. I'm going to give a simple answer. I hope it satisfies. The question is, I've, I've shown the consistency from the Hebrew Scriptures into the New Testament, from Moses into Jesus. Um, how do we grow in this knowledge? I, I think we keep reading. We keep meditating. We keep bringing into our minds these, these truths and principles which shape our understanding of our own identity. Um, the, the more we grow in this identity of being God's loved children, the more we're able to practice it. We, we learn it, and then we, we do it. We keep listening. We keep watching the steps. We keep practicing this love, and we keep asking for help, which is the essence of faith. Yes? Okay.
it is. Um, and there's no, Jesus does not um, lay out some grand public strategy for transforming society other than go out as loved children and love everybody. And, and there is a, <coughs> there's a slowness to that that's almost naive if we think this is really going to do something. And yet, this is what he calls us to. Um, I, I know that sounded like a political statement. No, I, I, I don't take it politically. I, 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 God knows we all need love, whether it's from the right or the left, and, and this is what will actually transform things. And, and then there are people who seek situations in which they can love. Um, Anna, Anna has a teacher at school uh, who loves well. Um, and the people who sit long enough with that teacher will start to know where that love comes from. Uh, others just know that they're loved, and that love transforms. So I think for us, finding the places where we need more love and going there and loving. I think we've run to the end of time. Thank you for your questions. Um, and uh, I l yeah, this was, this was lovely, and you, you, you did not fail me, so <laughs> bless you.